It's Modern Basketball Card Investing and Collecting 101. We're going to tell you the key sets, key players, and everything else you need to know to be a successful basketball card investor. Hello! Sports Card Investors, and welcome back to our Sports Card University series. And today, Modern Basketball Card Investing and Collecting 101, where we are going to dive in deep with basketball cards specifically and give you all of the things you need to know to be successful at investing in basketball cards. And before we go any further, two things you need to do right off the bat. The first is hit the subscribe button on this channel and the bell icon. If you are already subscribed, then give this video a like right now. We appreciate it when you do that. And second of all, if you haven't yet, download the Sports Card Investor app in the App Store on your phone because the Sports Card Investor app is free. And it is a great way to learn more about basketball cards and to see tens of thousands of basketball cards, what their values are, and what you can buy them for online. It is the Sports Card Investor app in the App Store. Go get it right now. All right, let's talk about basketball cards today, ladies and gentlemen. And there is an important reason why basketball cards are where we are focusing on this show. It's because basketball cards are the most popular part of the sports card hobby right now. And in fact, this has been the case for the last few years. If you go back and look at sales data on eBay from 2020, we don't have final 2021 numbers yet, so we're going to look at 2020. What you'll see is that the sports card hobby overall grew 142% in U.S. sales in 2020, but basketball cards grew 375%. Yes, Basketball cards significantly outpaced all of the other major U.S. sports, other than I think soccer, uh, but it outpaced baseball, it outpaced football, it outpaced uh, hockey in terms of its growth in popularity. Basketball cards is where a lot of attention of the sports card hobby has been. Part of the reason why basketball cards are so popular is because of their international appeal. We're seeing international collectors from places like Australia and China invest heavily in basketball cards. And in fact, within Market Movers, which is our sports card data analytics product, 15 of the top 25 most sold cards over the last year were basketball cards. The other 10 were baseball cards. Basketball is 15 of the top 25 and 8 of the top 10. Now, basketball is often linked to the hobby's explosive growth over the last few years, in part because of the Last Dance documentary. You guys remember that documentary that came out in early 2020 during the pandemic, and it really fueled interest in basketball cards. Michael Jordan's 1986 Fleer card is one of the hobby's most iconic cards, and the documentary helped fuel the nostalgia in collecting a lot of those great 1980s players. Additionally, the 2019 NBA draft class, which features Zion Williamson and John ja Morant, also helped push the hobby forward as collectors new and old were searching for the next Jordan or LeBron James. And basketball had also benefited from strong draft classes right before that. The 2018 draft class included players like Luca and Trey, and you had Jason Tatum and Donovan Mitchell in 2017. So basketball had a great run of draft classes for quite some time, and we may even have some emerging stars on our hand from subsequent draft classes like LaMelo Ball and Anthony Edwards, who will keep that going. Collecting and investing in vintage basketball cards has also become very popular and profitable in recent years. If you go back prior to 1980, it's hard to find basketball cards. There weren't that many sets, and the ones that were produced were not produced in big quantity. And the cards that exist, not many of them remain in really good top-graded condition. So a lot of those older vintage basketball cards have seen a lot of price escalation in the last few years. So now let's talk a bit about who is manufacturing basketball cards today and which cards you should concentrate on. 
So right now, the key basketball card manufacturer to concentrate on for new cards is Panini. Panini as a company holds the exclusive license at the moment to create basketball cards. And they create more than 20 different basketball card brands, names you have probably heard of, such as Prism, Select, and National Treasures. They are all created by Panini. From an investing standpoint, these types of Panini sets should be your primary focus. There are other companies that make basketball cards that are not licensed by the league. This means that the cards will not have team logos on them. But generally from an investment standpoint, those cards tend not to hold up as well in the long term. So stick with the officially licensed cards that Panini is putting out. Now it is worth mentioning that there will be a big change in the upcoming years. The NBA has granted the license in the future, a few years down the road, to Fanatic. So at some point in time, Fanatics will take over that license from Panini. Now you may have heard that Fanatics acquire Tops, so that likely means that the Tops brands, such as Tops and Tops Chrome, will start producing basketball cards in the future. Or it's also possible that Fanatics could acquire Panini, which could escalate this entire process of Fanatics getting in the basketball card world. And possibly it means that some of those Panini sets like Prism will persist into the future. We don't know what the future holds, but at the moment, it's the Panini products that you do want to be paying the most attention to for the new releases. Now, as you look at these different products, if you zoom in on a particular product, like Prism, for example, you're gonna notice that there's a lot of different types of cards within each particular product or set. For example, within Prism, there's a base card of every player. That's your standard run-of-the-mill card of every player in the Prism set. But then you get into parallels, you get into variations, you get into inserts. For example, there is a silver variation or a silver parallel within Prism that is a popular card from an investment standpoint because it is much less, uh, much less printed than the base card. So it's harder to ascertain, the values are therefore higher. Now in the baseball card world and in some other sports, these are known as refractors. We call them silvers within the basketball card world when you're looking at a set like Prism. There are other types of parallels which are serial numbered, meaning that they actually have numbers on the back of the card that they'll be numbered to 199 or 299 or gold cards are typically numbered to 10, for example. Those cards are inherently rare because there's only a certain number of them produced each year and you can tell that from the numbering on the card. There are also other parallels of cards that are not numbered but are still considered rare. So for example, in Prism, you have parallels like Purple Wave and Ruby Wave, and then even more rare parallels like Hyper Prism and Tiger Prince, which are short printed and can command a lot of value even though they are not serial numbered. Now, certain parallels are only available in certain types of boxes of a product. For example, in Prism, you can find green parallels exclusively in retail boxes, whereas serial numbered parallels come from hobby boxes. Fast break or disco parallels are extremely popular from fast break basketball boxes as well, which is another type of prism boxes that get released each year. Sets like Optic and Select are also known for their large lineup of parallels that now dominate the hobby. Some are numbered, some are rare, and some are really not rare at all and may not have very much value uh, compared to many of the other parallels. Of course, then there's also autograph cards and memorabilia cards. Um, and what we have seen though is that autograph cards and memorabilia cards have become a little less popular over time. It seems like with some of the sets like Prism, Panini is really placing a lot more emphasis on the parallels and the serial numbered cards as being the chase cards that you wanna go, go for. We've seen more and more sticker auto cards. That means autographs that are signed on stickers, clear stickers, and then the sticker is then placed on top of the card. These are generally not considered to be as valuable as when the player does an on-card autograph, meaning they sign the card directly. But we're seeing more of those sticker uh, autographs appear every day. We're also seeing memorabilia pieces be put into cards 
that are not game-worn, like many of them used to be, and in some cases not even player-worn, but are just simply a random piece of memorabilia that were put into the card. So as a result of that, the desire for memorabilia cards, the desire for autograph cards has decreased some, although they're still a big deal in really high-end sets like National Treasures and Flawless. Now, in general, when you're investing in basketball cards or cards of any type, it's your rookie cards that have the most value. But there are some exceptions. Some rare insert and parallel cards of non-rookies can be really valuable as well. Also, certain cards become really popular because of the photography. Like, for example, LeBron's 2008 Topps Chrome Chalk Toss photo on that card, or the 2008 Topps Chrome Kobe card, where he's being guarded by LeBron. The photos on both of those cards have made them very popular and sought after and therefore valuable. We've seen the same thing with the 2020 Prism LeBron card, where he's doing a tribute dunk to Kobe. Additionally, sometimes that you'll see that the first card of a player in a new set becomes popular. For example, 2012 Prism, that was the first year of Prism basketball. Cards from that set tend to go for a premium because that would be LeBron's first Prism card uh, or Kobe's first Prism card if you get their 2012 Prism card. And sometimes it's the first card of a player in a new jersey which also uh, commands some value as well. For example, when LeBron went to the Lakers, his first cards in Lakers jerseys in the photo, those cards tend to hold a little bit of a premium as well. So now you know a bit about the manufacturers of cards and different types about, of cards. Let's talk about the sets that you want to concentrate on from an investing standpoint. So when most people think about basketball cards, the first set they often think of is Prism. As I mentioned before, Prism first released in 2012, and Prism was Panini's answer to Topps Chrome. Topps Chrome was an extremely popular basketball set when Topps was making basketball cards, but Panini took over the exclusive licenses, and in 2012, Panini came out with Prism, which was their equivalent to Topps Chrome, and that is why Prism has been so popular in the basketball card hobby. Boxes of Prism basketball cards are available in a lot of different formats. You'll find hobby boxes and hobby shops, which contain a lot of the higher end cards, the serial numbered cards and, and that type. You'll find retail boxes of Prisms in your big box stores like Walmart and Target, or at least when you can actually find them on the store shelves, which has been a big challenge over the last couple of years. And then Prism has different variations. There's even first off the line Prism, which is sold directly from Panini, very, very expensive and premium product before the rest of the products come out every year. Now, one concern about Prism, and this applies to a lot of different types of cards in general, is that the print runs have been going progressively up every single year. What this means is that Panini is printing more and more and more every single year to keep up with consumer demand. But as an investor, you have to be concerned with the number of cards that are being printed today compared to the much fewer number of cards that were being printed five or 10 years ago. The print runs, the number of cards that, that were printed back in years like 2012, 2013, 2014, when Prism was just getting started, way lower, way less cards produced than in recent years, like 2021 and 2020, when there was a lot of production. So you do have to be careful about what that means in terms of the long-term viability of investing in cards like this. Now, within the Prism set, the Prism Silver is kind of considered a go-to rookie card for a lot of investors and collectors. It has a much lower print run than the Prism Base cards. The Prism Silvers are analogous to the Topps Chrome Refractor cards, so they have that history, and they are a card that a lot of people like to go after. But there are still a lot of Prism Silvers printed every year, so recently, collectors and investors have turned their attention to other types of parallels and short prints, which are uh, perhaps printed in a lower number and maybe offer some additional long-term value in terms of that. There's also the gold parallel, of which there's only 10 of each year. These are serial number to 10. That is a considered one of the major chase cards in Prism, as well as any other product. If you get one of the golds of a key rookie card, those can be worth tens of thousands of dollars. 
Of course, they're very, very difficult to find. Everybody's chasing them and your odds of actually pulling one out of a pack of prism, not very good. Now let's talk about Donruss Optic. Donruss Optic made its basketball debut in 2016, and it has become a popular alternative to Prism and Select, another set we're gonna talk about. Like Prism, Optic's retail formats make it widely available when you can find it on the store shelves of retailers, but once again, this leads to higher print runs. The Optic Hollow is one of the hobby's signature parallels. It is analogous to the Prism Silver, so you have the Optic Hollow and the Prism Silver uh, kind of on that same level in terms of chase cards. A lot of collectors and investors like to go after those Optic Hollows of the rookies that they are trying to grab from any particular year. Uh, now, it is worth noting that that Optic is actually a Chrome upgrade to the Paper Donruss release. So there is a Paper Donruss release. Donruss basketball cards every year come out in a paper cardboard format where Optic is the chromey, shiny version of those same cards. What people like about Optic as well as the paper version of Donruss is the Rated Rookie logo. That Rated Rookie logo in the corner, of course, has persisted in the sports card hobby going back to Donruss baseball cards in the 1980s. So people love that Rated Rookie logo and they loved collecting that. There's also an insert series in Optic called the Rookies. They have a low print run, although they're not as popular as the signature rated rookie cards. Optic also traditionally carries some inserts worth collecting. Uh, some really nice, interesting inserts designs within Optic, and you can find those in parallels as well, like silver and purple. All right, let's talk about Select. Personally, one of my very, very favorite sets across all sports was Select, eh, until Panini started creating a ton of parallels and maybe overprinting it a bit in recent years, but I do still love Select overall. Select was originally part of Score. Select was re-released by Panini in 2012 as its own standalone set for basketball. Like Prism, Select has an incredible lineup of parallels. Some popular ones include tie-dye, zebra, and tiger print. And recently they've been adding to that parallel lineup really, really heavily, and they continue to come out with more and more parallels. Things like elephant print have maybe taken things a step too far and have become a little meme worthy in the, in the hobby. Until recently, Select was a hobby only product, which is why many collectors, including myself, preferred it over sets like Optic and Prism. What that meant was you could only find Select in hobby shops. You could only buy it in hobby boxes, higher end hobby boxes. It was not available in retail. You could not find it at a Target or Walmart. However, Panini recently changed that and Select is now available at retail like Optic and Prism and other sets. Now let's talk about the high end of basketball cards and let's talk about National Treasures. Outside of Prism, National Treasures is likely the most important basketball set out there. And for high-end collectors, they would say National Treasures is probably the most important basketball set out there. The Rookie Patch Autos, known as RPAs, are the signature rookies in the hobby for basketball players. They often carry the highest premium on the secondary market of any rookie card. And National Treasures is known for these RPAs containing ultra high-end patches and on-card autographs. These are definitely the chase cards that you and I would covet to have. People often compare National Treasures to Upper Deck's Exquisite Collection, which were the high-end chase cards of the 2000s. And National Treasures cards, they set some records. The Logo Man cards are amongst the rarest and coolest in the hobby, with Luca's record-breaking one-of-one RPA Logo Man from National Treasures going for well over $4 million. Let's stay on the high end and let's talk about Flawless, a counterpart to National Treasures that is also one of the most important high-end sets in the hobby. Flawless features incredible patches and autographs. And Flawless RPAs, much like the National Treasures RPAs, are some of the most sought after cards in the hobby. Now, there are some collectors that prefer Flawless to National Treasures overall. 
Most consider them to be roughly the same tier for quality and prestige. You can't go wrong if you've got a rookie card of a key player in National Treasures or Flawless, that is a card you're going to want to hold on to. Now those are just a few of the 20 plus basketball sets that come out every single year. Others worth noting include hoops on the low end of the market, tends to be an affordable kind of entry level set, but it's one that has a long legacy in basketball cards. It has been around for many, many years. In the mid tier, Mosaic is a popular set that has come on in recent years. And on the high end, sitting next to Flawless and National Treasures are sets like Impeccable and Immaculate, to name just a few. Now, it is worth noting that all of the sets that I just talked about are sets that Panini is currently producing today. But if you go back prior to Panini having the license for basketball cards, if you go back into, let's say, the 2000s, for example, there you're going to see Tops and Tops Chrome as very popular cards to go after, as well as Tops Finest. You're also going to see Upper Deck producing cards, including on the high end, Exquisite. So if you're looking for LeBron James rookies or Kevin Durant rookies or Steph Curry's rookies from the 2000s, those are going to appear in tops and upper deck sets. Now that we've told you about the popular sets, let's also tell you about insert cards because they're very important in basketball. Inserts are kind of sets within a set. They're a little mini set, which appears in those larger sets such as Prism. And inserts have had a big importance in basketball card collecting for many years, going back to the 1990s when there were many, many iconic insert sets like uh, Duncan Go Nuts and Beam Team and Jambalaya and Big Men on Court. Those were all insert sets, those and many others that a lot of the 1990 basketball card collectors still covet and pay big dollars for today. But today, there are new insert sets that come out in Panini's new products every year that are definitely worth noting. The first is Kaboom. Kaboom has actually been an insert in a whole bunch of different sets. Panini moves which set Kaboom cards are going to be in around every year. But it doesn't matter what set it's part of. What matters is the fact that it is very important for collectors and investors. People love Kaboom cards. It has kind of a cartoonish comic book style that is loved in the hobby. It also has a very bright, captivating silver background. They are very tough to grade because of surface issues and full bleed backs that can easily show corner and edge damage but in some ways that makes them all the more popular. If you get a Kaboom that has a perfect gem mint grade, that is a card that many are going to want. Another popular insert is Color Blast. Color Blast is a newer addition to the insert pool. It's a simple design that features explosive colors behind a player's cutout. It has appeared in Spectra for basketball. It sells very well on the secondary market, both in raw and graded condition. Downtown is another popular insert set. It features highly specific backgrounds unique to each team and player and is also highly sought after in the hobby. It's typically considered a case hit, meaning there's only one downtown card per case of cards. And a case of cards often contains like 12 different hobby boxes within it. Although, although some are speculating that recently uh, downtown cards have become a little more common than they were in previous years. Downtown has also moved between products every year like Color Blast. You also have Stained Glass. Stained Glass appears in Mosaic for basketball. It appears in a Prism and Mosaic for football. Stained Glass features a church-like stained glass background behind a color, behind a player cutout. Now in Previous years, stained glass, the cards themselves actually truly resembled stained glass. You could see the light shining through the cards. That is not the case with the current years of stained glass inserts. Personally, I don't like them as much for that reason. I don't really consider them that special anymore, but they are case hits. They are very rare as a result, and they therefore sell very, very well on the secondary market. Now there are other insert sets that are popular as well and it's always interesting to see what insert sets get more popular over time. There are plenty of sports card investors that have made really good money by make, making a speculative bet 
on a certain insert set and buying a lot of those inserts thinking that it will become more popular with the sports card hobby over time. Sometimes those bets pay off. So now you know all about the cards, but let's talk about what players you want to invest in. And something you should know as a basketball card investor is that you often want to concentrate on the key players because oftentimes the players who are really, really great, well-established players, players who have won championships are the players who will go on to be worth the most in the long run. It's fun to buy rookie cards. It's fun to speculate on rookies, but a lot of rookies don't pan out and don't turn out to be worth much in the long run. So that is much more of, an, of a speculative play. So I'm going to give you some big names of players who are currently playing, tell you a little bit about their cards, and then we'll talk a little bit about retired players and Hall of Famers and vintage cards in a minute as well. But let's start the conversation with LeBron James. You guys know LeBron was a rookie in 2003. Uh, and so his rookie cards were in uh, Tops and Upper Deck products from 2003, FLIR products as well. Um, a big hit in Tops Chrome in those early years, a big chase of Tops Chrome. And then, of course, recently LeBron has been in all the Panini products like Prism. Now, LeBron James cards are still big chase cards every single year. Even though we're way removed from his rookie year, people still chase after LeBron James cards in every single set. Any LeBron James card that is a lower numbered parallel or short print insert can carry significant premium on the secondary market. Let's talk about Giannis. Giannis was a rookie as part of the second Prism and Select sets from 2013. He's incredibly popular both on and off the court because of his incredible play and his lovable personality. And by the way, personality makes a big difference when it comes to card values over time. A lot of times investors like to buy the cards of players who seem to have a larger than life lovable personality. Giannis tends to be one of those guys. His cards did not take off immediately. He wasn't a super popular player coming right off of the gate. So that actually can make sometimes his cards a little more rare because people weren't necessarily holding on to them in the early days. But now his rookie cards and his RPAs are definitely well sought after. Another lovable player is Steph Curry and Steph Curry's cards have been hot as can possibly be recently. Now Steph Curry was a rookie in 2009. He actually has rookie cards both in Panini products as well as Topps products because for a short period of time, both Panini and Topps were producing cards. But his Topps Chrome and Topps Chrome refractor cards are particularly important from 2009 in terms of collecting his rookie cards. He is a player who is so likable that even today, if you get new Steph Curry cards in new sets, if you get short printed cards or low numbered serial cards, they tend to have a really nice value. Another player to concentrate on is Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant's rookies come from 2007. His tops and tops chrome rookies and refractors from 2007 are particularly well sought after. Now in terms of newer players, Luca is a player that absolutely changed the basketball card investing game when his cards came out in 2018. He was a player who everybody was absolutely chasing, and he's a go-to for many collectors who are looking to prospect on a younger player. But one area of concern with Lucas cards are the print runs, because as we get into cards produced from 2018 onward, they were printed a lot more than some of the other players who I just mentioned who are more veterans in their careers. So as you look at at Luca's Prism cards or Optic cards, there's high population of those cards, particularly the base variations of those cards. So you generally want to look to parallels, look to short prints, etc. But Luca's cards, no matter what type, even base cards, they are still highly liquid and still sought after on the market. Easy cards to buy and sell out of. Of course, Luca's popular NBA draft class counterpart from 2018. Trey Young. Trey Young's cards are very sought after as well. Not quite as popular as Luca, but Young is still a young player and is sought after by many collectors and investors who want to invest in younger talent. 
And then we got to talk about Zion, the young player from the 2019 draft class, much like Luca and Trey, is linked to the hobby's explosive growth. Therefore, his cards have become extremely popular to collect. Now they have definitely gone down with the injury problems that he has had recently paired with the fact that there were a lot of basketball cards printed in 2019. So his cards are high population, especially when you're looking at like his prism base cards or anything of that nature. But still, there are still a lot of Zion fans out there and there are still a lot of people that believe this guy is going to have an impact on the court for some time to come. So Zion cards remain popular and they remain liquid as an investment opportunity. So we just talked about some of the current players that you want to look at, but don't forget about retired players, Hall of Famers, all-stars from years past, and their vintage cards. Because while many new collectors in the hobby rush to go get those ultra-modern cards of the new rookies, vintage cards are often a better investment overall, especially for the long term. Retired Hall of Famers tend to be solid investments because they have an established career and established accomplishments. A lot of those rookies that we like to speculate in, what are the chances that they actually are going to end up with a better career than those proven retired Hall of Famers? Also, the Hall of Famers have a long history of price changes on their cards. You can see the price data going back many, many years. And there's not events that typically are going to cause their prices to rise and fall as dramatically as modern players can rise and fall. If you see a player, for example, get injured or get eliminated from playoff contention, you'll often see their prices immediately fall. With retired Hall of Famers, you don't have those types of things to worry about. Also, print runs on ultra-modern cards, as I've talked about throughout this episode, also tend to be quite high, where a lot of the older cards from the 1980s and prior in basketball, there tend to be a lot less of those cards in existence. And a lot of the hobby is driven by supply and demand. The basic economic principle of supply and demand is absolutely a big driver to card prices in the hobby. So if you have older, older vintage basketball cards with less supply overall, typically the evolving demand for those types of cards can drive the prices up over time. Now there are obviously tons of different Hall of Famers you could look to, but some key vintage cards uh, that you may want to start with is the 1957-58 Topps Bill Russell rookie card. The 1961-62 Fleer Wilt Chamberlain rookie card, the 1969-70 Topps Luau Cinder rookie card, the 1961-62 Fleer Oscar Robertson rookie card, the 1972-73 Topps Julius Irving rookie card, and the iconic 1980-81 Topps Larry Bird Magic Johnson Julius Irving card. Those are some of the most sought after cards in the basketball card hobby. So now that you have some cards in mind that you might want to go after, the question is, do you want to get them in raw condition or graded condition? Now, we have plenty of other episodes on this channel in our Sports Card University series where we have talked extensively about topics like this. In general, we often recommend buying graded over raw because there's consistency in the condition of the card. You know the condition if you are buying the card in a graded score. And also graded cards are authenticated so you don't have to worry about fakes, which can be a problem, particularly if you're buying older basketball cards. There are fakes of those cards that exist out there in the market. Also, buying graded cards allows you to more easily understand the price history. You can look those cards up in the Sports Card Investor app or in Market Movers to see what they have sold for recently. Now, the grading landscape has changed recently. Uh, the grading shutdowns where, where a lot of the grading companies had to stop except, accepting cards for a while in uh, 2021 changed the landscape. But all throughout it, PSA is still considered the ideal company in terms of resale value. And you can tell how popular basketball is in the sports card hobby because it was the most graded category of sports cards at PSA last year, by far. Whoo, that's a lot of information about modern basketball cards. 
but there's still more to learn. And in the Sports Card Investor University series on our YouTube channel, we cover lots of other aspects of card collecting and investing in detail. I recommend go watching some of those other episodes in the Sports Card University playlist. And give this channel a subscribe, hit that like button, hit that bell icon right now if you haven't already, and go download the Sports Card Investor app because that app is free in the App Store and it is going to be your best friend as you venture into the world of modern basketball card investing. It is a fun world. I love basketball card investing. I think you're gonna love it as well. I hope you enjoy your journey and stay tuned to this channel for more episodes like this to help you along your way. Thanks and take care.